can be a really challenging thing to buy at the store. I've got two different kinds of tomatoes here. These are Roma tomatoes. They're the in some simple cutting methods so that we're ready to use in our recipe. So I'm going to go ahead and set it on a plate to rest. And I want to give it 10 to 15 minutes rest. Let's talk about avocado. Now obviously that brings up the question of food safety. Is it safe for my food to just be sitting on the counter and use that? It's important to understand that cooking with chicken is really not unsafe as long as you do it right. Make sure that you have clean hands. Use just chicken on the floor. Hi, my name is Tom Small, and today we're going to talk about cooking techniques. You know, there's tons of recipes out in the world. You can go on the internet and find a recipe for just about anything you're looking for. But today we want to talk more about the actual inner workings of how to make a recipe work. What do we do with the products that we buy at the store? How do we store them? How do we pick the very best ingredients? And how do we use those ingredients to their maximum capacity so that when we make a recipe, it works every time or nearly every time? We'll talk about some of the mistakes that can happen and the ways that we can fix those things. So today, not so many recipes to look at, but more about the products themselves and how we can use those most effectively. about apples for a minute. Apples are available year-round and they're useful for so many things. I really love cooked apples with pork. Uh, love to eat them fresh. My girls love to eat them all the time. And they really are good year-round. They are mostly harvested in the fall and winter time, but because they're storage crop you can use them all the time. I've got four different kinds of apples here and there's probably 10 to 20 of them available in your store. This is a Red Delicious. Uh, this is a Gala apple. This is a Granny Smith apple, and this is a Fuji apple. And one of the things that you have to consider is which apples are good for eating and which apples are good for cooking because there's such a difference in them. And there's a real easy rule of thumb that you can use. If I set them up like this and say that green apples are best for cooking, they tend to be a little bit more acidic, they have thicker skins, they're a little denser so they won't fall apart while they cook, and red apples are best for eating in almost every case. All of the apples that are in between that have a little bit of red and a little bit of green on them are good for just about any application. Any apples like a golden delicious, like a yellow apple, those are going to fall apart when you cook them and so they're only really useful for eating fresh. So let's talk about how to prepare apples in some simple ways. First of all we want to talk about peeling because that's one of the things that we do most often when we're cooking. We want to get the skin out of there. Particularly with a Granny Smith apple, it has a really thick skin. I've seen a lot of people cut the apple into cores and then take their time and peel each piece and it's just a mess all over the place. So recommendation is to peel it first. You can use a vegetable peeler and just work your way around and make a nice long string. You could also do this with a paring knife if you felt that would be easier, but a vegetable peeler usually works perfectly well. And we're just going to peel the whole thing. It'll be nice and quick this way. That's how we can identify whether something's a fruit or a vegetable. So all I did was just take my knife and cut right down the center just to open it up. The easiest way to get this out is to just hit it with your knife so that it sticks and it's attached and then just twist. Now that that's out of the way I'm going to take a paring knife and let's say we want to dice this. I'm going to dice it in the skin so I'm holding this but I'm not touching it with the back of my hand and I'm running my knife in very gently and just guiding it along and cutting both directions. So now I've diced up my avocado, all I need to do is just take a spoon and I'm just going to scoop right around the outside, pressing on the skin to make sure that I don't cut the flesh and I've got perfectly diced avocado ready to go. If I wanted to slice it or do some other preparation with it, I could do that as well by taking it out of the skin first. So I'm going to run my spoon around and get underneath and take out the entire avocado piece. Now that I've done that, I can go back through and I can slice it nice and thin if I want to use it in a different application. When you're picking an avocado, you want to find one that's firm 
but just yields just a little bit to pressure. So when you squeeze it, it should give just a little bit, but not too much. Anytime you find ones that have soft spots on them, it just means that it's been bruised or damaged. And so you want to make sure that you uh, pick one that isn't been damaged on the inside. And clean up my board here a little bit. Let's talk about kiwi fruit. Kiwi fruit, not really a Mediterranean or Italian fruit, but it is a, uh, a real common one around the stores and really, really great. Uh, the easiest way to do this is very similar to the avocado. So I'm going to just cut it in half right down the center and that's going to open it up. I'm going to take a spoon and I'm going to put my spoon on the inside like that. and I'm just going to work it around. This skin is fairly soft so it can tear, but it shouldn't if I do it real carefully. And then once I do that, I can just peel it back all the way. Work with fresh herbs. And I'm going to cut now it right that the time's there. been just about right, let me go ahead and pull out this artichoke and we'll take a look at that because it should be perfectly cooked and ready to go. Take my tongs and I'm just going to drain it off. Then we'll set it on the board so that we can take a look at it. And you can see that the color's kind of turned an olive color olive green. Uh, it would turn much darker than that if I hadn't added the lemon juice to it. The way I can tell it's done is I'm just going to grab one of these leaves and I'm just going to pull it out. It'll come right out. If you check it and it's still firm, if you have to tug on it to get them loose, then it's not ready to go. Just let it cook a little bit longer. This is now perfectly ready to eat. The best thing to do is just take it and, and scrape it off. And uh, you can dip it in a little mayonnaise or butter, but it's really a great vegetable to have all by itself just like that. With garlic, it's, it's again somewhat difficult to, to pick a great head of garlic. A lot of times the garlic that's sitting in the grocery store has been sitting around for way too long. And so what we're looking for is we're looking for skin that's as firm as possible. Uh, garlic, when it's harvested, they go through and they, they crush down the stems and they let them dry in the field. And so it is a dry product. It's something that's already been sitting around for a long time. But once it gets to this state, once the top is cut off and the root ball is cut off and it's been sitting in the grocery store, that paper is going to start to come loose and fall off. And so we know that we're going to have the freshest garlic inside. The wishbone goes right across uh, the neck here as a sort of U or V-shaped bone. And I want to make sure that I avoid cutting through that as I go down. Start on the other side, just straight down and cut that through. We'll cut all the way down to the front. Let the gravity pull the meat down. So we just do little cuts to open it up. All the way down. And there's my other breast. Now I've got the legs left. I'm going to do a little cut right here. There's a little hip bone sticking out on the outside. And then I'm just going to twist and that's going to pop the joint loose. Once I do that, be really easy for me to get in with my knife and cut all the way through. So now I've got thigh and leg. I can feel in the middle and find where the joint is and I can cut right through it. And I've sectioned them into leg and thigh pieces now. We'll do that again on the other side. We'll find the joint in the middle. get our leg and thigh separated. And I've got a chicken that's completely broken down. I've got the carcass here and we're going to make stock with that in just a minute, so I'll set that aside. Another chicken that we're going to do is going to be a braised chicken. I also want that cut into eight pieces. And so let me just go ahead and show you those techniques one more time. And I know it takes a little bit of time to figure out how to do this. And really when it comes down to this kind of cooking, it's just practice. It's just the more you do it, the better you're going to be at it. And you can take your time and get it done right. Wings first. And then the breast. And cut down the breastbone. And let gravity pull it down. And do the same thing on the other side. And then cut through and cut down the breast and let it fall down, just making little cuts to release the meat from the carcass. Cut through that skin. And then our legs and thighs. 
Just pop that backwards so that we can release the bone. We'll find the joint in the middle. Get our leg and thigh separated. And then one more time on the other side. The braised chicken is going to cook in just about the same time. And remember, because we're talking about the method, we really haven't done much to this chicken. It's still going to have pretty amazing flavor, though. I'm just going to take the pieces and pull them out. It's going to have a much lighter texture. It doesn't have any or consistency on the top. It doesn't have any caramelization because it's been covered the entire time. But the meat is going to be very, very tender and flavorful and very juicy inside. You can transfer all of that out to a bowl. And then what we've really done with our braising liquid, remember we just started with a little bit of wine and salt and olive oil, is that we've created a liquid very similar to what we did when we pan sauteed and built a pan sauce, is we've got a reduced wine liquid now that we can just put right over the chicken. And we've got a very simple method for braising chicken and for roasting chicken. Before, and let it rest. Because what I want to do is I want to cut into these steaks and let you see the difference between a steak that is rested and a steak that has not. Because I really think it makes a huge difference. So this is my rested steak over here. And I want to cut it into some slices. It's still quite rare in the middle. But as I open it up, you can see that it's uniformly cooked. There's no juice running out of the meat. All the juices have settled into the steak and are perfect and ready to serve. So when I kind of fan this out and put it on my plate, it looks great. To finish a steak, I always just do a little bit of salt and just a little drizzle of oil. Now this is the steak that just came off the stove top, just finished cooking. And as I cut into it, you can already see that we've got a problem. There's juices on the board. There's juices that are running out as I cook it. It's not as uniformly cooked. It looks a little more cooked on the, on the exterior and the middle is still completely raw. I'm gonna take this and transfer it over. And you can see on my cutting board all of that juice. Now that's all flavor and moisture and tenderness that I've lost the opportunity to have in the steak and instead I've got it sitting on my cutting board and wasted. In the bone I can see that so the juices have started to come up. That lets me know that it's starting to cook all the way through. The other thing is that it's released well from the pan. When I first put it down, it's really going to stick, but as it releases, it means it's ready to go. See, I got great surface area and great caramelization on this steak. Yeah, it's going to take just another six to eight minutes to cook it to medium rare. The, the steak is cooked about seven minutes on the other side. I see a couple things. I see the juice starting to come up on the meat itself now. Um, and I know that it's well caramelized on both sides. So I'm gonna go ahead and set it on a plate to rest. And I wanna give it 10 to 15 minutes rest. It's such a big steak before I cut into it or serve it to anybody. 